Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us as we continue the 20 to 21 lecture in mathematics education series. Today we are excited to visit with Dr. Alan Schoenfeld from UC Berkeley. And the lectures in mathematics education series is sponsored by the Herman and Rashe Math Initiative and Rossier School of Education with the goal of highlighting important research targeted at improving teacher effectiveness in mathematics education. We are thankful to be able to provide access to this series virtually and for our guest speakers and those joining us for being flexible enough to work in the new found digital space. Today, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Schoenfeld, who will be talking about teaching for robust understanding powerful instruction for all students. Alan Schoenfeld is a Elizabeth and Edward Conner Professor of Education and affiliated professor of mathematics at the University of California at, at Berkeley. Schoenfeld's research focuses on teaching for robust understanding and includes topics such as thinking, teaching, and learning. Schoenfeld has written, edited, or co-edited 22 books and approximately 200 articles on thinking and learning. He has an ongoing interest in the development of productive mechanism for systemic change and for deepening the connection between educational research and practice. He has received numerous awards and honors for his work. He is a fellow at the, of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and of the American Educational Research Association and a laureate of the Education Honor Society, Happy Delta Pi. He has served as president of AERA and vice president of the National Academy of Education. He holds the International Commission on Mathematics Instruction Coin Medal, the highest international distinction in mathematics education. AERA's Distinguished Com Contribution to Research in Education Award, AERA's highest honor, and the Mathematical Association of America's Mary P. Doshini Dosh Award, given to a pure or applied mathematician for distinguished contributions to the mathematical education of K-16 students. After Dr. Schoenfeld finished, we will have time for questions. When the time comes, we ask that you post questions in the chat and we will go get to as many as we can. So thank you again for joining us and I will turn it over to Dr. Schoenfeld. Well, thank you very much, <coughs> Ting Shang. Um, thank you, Shira. It's uh, a pleasure to the phrase be here is a little funny given where I am. I'm staring at the same computer I stare at 12 hours a day, seven days a week, but it's a pleasure to be in your virtual company. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. I will do my best to keep the talk close to within time limits so that we actually have uh, time to uh, do a Q and A. Um, so here goes. Um, the title for my talk is Teaching for Robust Understanding, Powerful Instruction for All Students. And the all students is a key part of it. Uh, the powerful and the all. What we care about is um, rich and meaningful instruction that every single student has the opportunity to engage with. Uh, let me tell you what my plan is for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. I'd like to start by um, putting what I'm about to say in perspective. Uh, for those of you who have trouble going to sleep, I had forwarded a copy of a paper that is much more than I can uh, talk about today. Uh, but I hope if you had a chance to read it, it stimulates questions and I'm open for just about anything. The idea was, and it sort of mirrors my career, that if you're gonna think about powerful mathematical thinking for all students, you start with what it means to think mathematically. Um, what does it really understand to be a powerful mathematical thinker and problem solver? And for those folks who um, 
know about my background, there's this little bit of light reading called mathematical problem solving that represented the first 10 years or so of my career, which focuses on um, what does it really mean to understand mathematics and be a productive thinker? Well, the goal is for all students to be able to do that, for all students to be knowledgeable, resourceful thinkers and problem solvers. And for that, you really have to think about the learning environment. You have to ask the question, what do we need to know about creating powerful learning environments from which students emerge as powerful and empowered thinkers. Um, and then the tougher question, all of that takes place within the cultural surround. Uh, and that's at multiple levels. Um, on one hand, Within any particular classroom, the teacher is supported and constrained by the curriculum, by the environment, by testing, by all of the constraints within the school, within the district. Uh, and part, uh, the second part of part three, um, what the students and the culture bring with them. Um, learning doesn't take place in a vacuum. It takes place within the context of everything that's going on in the surrounding culture. And uh, as the events of the past six months or so have made patently clear, those affect every single aspect of our lives in multiple ways. Um, the uh, what COVID has done to schooling in general, what it's revealed about societal biases, et cetera, all of that plays out in our classrooms. And if we had six weeks, we could begin to get into all of those issues in depth. But I've got about 40 minutes left. So what I'm gonna do is largely focus on the nature of the learning environment with, um, the promise that I'm happy to entertain questions about absolutely anything. So here goes. Um, the goal, if we think about teaching and learning, is to build classrooms from which students emerge as powerful thinkers. Uh, and I don't mean some students, I mean all students. So I'm gonna pose two big questions and they'll be the main themes for the talk. The first is, can we name five, and I'll talk about five in a minute, essential properties of classrooms from which kids emerge as knowledgeable, resourceful, effective thinkers. And second, if we have a good answer to that, then how do we support teachers in helping create such environments? So those are the big issues for the middle ring in that framing I showed you before. Um, so being a linear start, I'll start person, I'll start with question one. What counts in classrooms? What are five essential properties? Now, if we were doing this live and if we had two hours, I would have you all take a minute or two, write them down and we would make a list on the board of the things that you created. But we don't, so I'm gonna move on for now and return to part of that. Why did I say five? Um, and the answer is you can't cope with more than five. There's a very, for those who have psychology backgrounds, there's a very famous paper by George Miller, The Magic Number Seven Plus or Minus Two, which says in short-term memory, you can't keep more than seven plus or minus two things in mind. Otherwise, it's just too much to juggle. Um, and that's why I would have done the exercise that I was talking about. If I asked each of you to name five things that have gotten out of all of you a list of 25, 30 things. And then my question would have been, 
What are you going to do with that list? Suppose I give a teacher a list of 30 things to pay attention to. The answer is the same as when you give kids lists of things. It goes in the backpack crumpled up because you can't make use of it. What you need is a short list of powerful things. So what makes them powerful? What properties should they have? First of all, they better cover the waterfront. They're all you need. If you miss out on something essential, then a list of things to pay attention to doesn't do you any good. Second, I don't like things that are just theoretical. I like them to have practical import. So if I give you a list of five things, I'd like them to be things we can work on. And in particular, we can work on with professional learning communities so that teachers can get better and better at them. Okay, well, I wouldn't have posed the question unless I thought I had an answer. So I'm about to introduce you to the true framework, teaching for robust understanding. Um, we spent a huge amount of time trying to make sense of what really counts. My poor graduate students at the time lived through all of my mistakes as I built framework after framework that didn't quite make sense. Um, fortunately, we're after that. I will spare you the details uh, and try to do it um, a different way. What I'm going to do is show you a video that embodies many of the key points, and then I will um, abstract those points after you've seen the video. Uh, there are loads of papers that provide the substance and explain where true came from. That's one of them. If you go to our website, there are a dozen other papers as well. So let me prep you for the video. It was taken in an inner city Chicago school where um, 90% or so of the students are minoritized, 90% uh, or so were getting free or reduced lunch. Um, the students were working on what's called a formative assessment lesson. Uh, I'll tell you more about that <clears throat> and more about them in general. Uh, these are extended two to three day lessons designed to support teachers in teaching in highly interactive ways, formative assessment, um, built by the Mathematics Assessment Project. There are about 8 million lesson downloads uh, to date. They're fairly widely used. Um, this lesson started by giving students a bunch of cards that they separated, the first eight of them have either a decimal or a percent on them. And the idea at first is fill in the missing ones. So 0 0.2 is 20%, uh, 0 0.05 is 5%, uh, down to uh, 1.25 is 125%, et cetera. In some cases you're given, whoops, I just pointed at the screen, that was intelligent. Uh, in some cases, you're given 12.5% and you have to convert that into 0 0.125. The students working in small groups are supposed to take turns, first filling them in, but then the more, the greater challenge, placing the cards in order of size. And anyone who's taught elementary school knows that if you look at the middle row, some of the students will say that 375 is greater than 75. So they will say that 0.375 is larger than 0.75. And someone else will disagree and they'll have to sort it out. And that's the beginning because then they're given area models and asked to match the area cards to the decimals percents, fill in where there are blanks, explain their thinking, and make sure they're all lined up precisely. And if that's not sadistic enough, we then give them 
fractions and we give them uh, number lines and say, do the same thing, match where you see a match, fill in a blank card if there's a blank and you need to fill in a row and make sure you agree. When you're all done, you'll have something like this covering your desks. Uh, the gray things are things the students filled in. So um, they will have the numbers going, starting with the decimal cards from 0 0.05 to 1.25. And then underneath them will be, one hopes, the correct fractions, area models and um, <clears throat> linear models. So I'm gonna tell you what happened. Um, we're gonna see a video of the students working in small groups. The first part, you'll see one explaining to another uh, just how to convert 50% to a decimal. This group has worked together a fair amount. The teacher has built a good explanatory culture. You can see the kids talking to each other about the real math, but one of the things, if you remember the last column, it was 1.25. And one student drew this picture, which is a whole unit. And he claims that 1.25. And a second student challenges him, saying, that's one. That's not 1.25. The first one then goes on and says, no, no, no. It's like um, if each of these little squares is a five, then it's five, 10, 15, and it adds up to 125. And the first student goes, wait a second, let's look at a whole, that's 100%, which is bigger, 125% or 100%. And the other one says, well, 125%. Doesn't that mean you should have something bigger than a whole? And they work through it, you'll see them work through it. Here's the video as it takes place. I don't know how many of you, well, everyone should remember this worksheet that we did that was fractions, decimals, and percents. Yeah. Okay, and remember I said this was more of a pre-assessment to see what you know already and what we still need to work on. So based on what you did on this worksheet, we're gonna do an activity today where you're going to be working with your partner most of the time, okay? There are going to be times where you're going to work with your group and I'll let you know when those times are. All right, so right now everyone's getting a worksheet. Once you and your partner have sorted your cards, so you're filling in the blanks first, then you're sorting them from left to right. That's why I don't want anything else on your desk. So you have space. Once you've sorted them, then you're going to turn and talk to your group members to check and challenge your explanation if they disagree. And remember you have your sentence starters that you can use and they're in your notebook as well to challenge or uh, each other's explanations or check for understanding. To change it into a decimal, you need to put the zero because it's not a whole yet, because it's at 50, it's at half, because the percent sign equals out of 100. So now the tens place would equal 50 because 10, 10 times 5 is 50. So now it is, it's a decimal, so it's tens. So, and if you wanted to add a zero, it would be a fine, so it could be more easier to understand and be a 50. I want to challenge Kashana on eighty uh, percent. I think it's wrong. Yes, yes. I disagree. I I I disagree with you. I disagree with you, Kishanda, because eighty percent is not equal zero point zero eight percent. So, I guess I'm here with you. Can you please clarify okay. how did you get it? Can you clarify how you did it? So if, you're, if you put 0.5, it means that you're practically saying that it's 50%. So change it to 5, change it to just plain 5%. So, Kevin, do you know why she changed it to 5%? Yeah. Yes, because that's the only one doing it. Right. But, but, like, do you understand why does she say to change it to 5%? Yes. Why? Because 50%? No, no, 5% oh, always just just one and it does go well, close to 50%. Yeah. Okay, so, let's go. Next, uh, 12.5%. Same thing. Okay, so then she, she, she is, is good. This okay, 
So I think I know how you got one in twenty fit one one fourth because what you did was oh, one whole because of the one and then when you did one fourth because of the twenty five, which is one fourth because twenty five times four would equal one hundred. Where you can kind of get the idea of quarters, and then that's how you got one hundred twenty five percent and one in one fourth. Yeah, that's right. And then we got like uh, twelve point five percent over here because it's one eighth, fifth, one half equals fifty percent, and then to get one fourth you have to divide that, which is twenty five percent, and then you you have to divide that to get one eighth, and twenty five divided by half when you two equals twelve point five percent, and over here it's three eighths. Well, I already explained that. The one eighth equals twelve point five percent, and twelve point five percent times three equals um, um let me see thirty seven point five percent, which is right. So three eighths equals thirty seven point five percent. I know that you got one hundred twenty five percent for one point two five, and that is right. That one point that is right that one and equals one but the problem is the picture you you just shaded like this whole thing and this and even if like a, even if it's not even a whole because you're missing this part and like I'm not missing any part it's not like yeah it's not one and and it's not one one hundred twenty five percent equals one and a fourth. No, it's not, no, it's not it's supposed to be one and a fourth. It's actually most like most likely all these squares it just equals five in each in each square. Like, you know? Yeah, because if you if you would actually like if you put if you would do like five ten and then it would go to it would all go to one hundred and twenty five. Um no I would like to see what you done. I'm gonna challenge you. What is is what does one equal? One equals what percent? One, the number one, hundred. What's greater, a hundred twenty-five percent or one percent? A hundred percent. Um, hundred twenty-five percent. So doesn't that means that since a hundred twenty-five percent is greater, doesn't that means that a hundred twenty-five percent is more than one? Yes. Tell me if this answer is right or wrong. It's right. Why is it right? It's right because it does, if it, it if it does when it, oh wait so the wait now actually I think I know where you're going with this um the fraction for this would be um one and yeah. four that's where why I'm going. I, why 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 didn't you let me see? <laughs> okay um. The teacher was in her second year of teaching. It was an inner city school. Uh, and yet what you see is pretty amazing. Um, the students were really grappling with the mathematics, with the meaning. I showed the first part because you, the teacher plays a significant role, including in building the culture. Um, but what happens uh, involves respectful, solid mathematics discourse in a bunch of sixth graders. So let me uh, first just make an assertion for reasons of time um, that in classrooms where this kind of give and take happens, this kind of pedagogy, the students learn at least as much content and they're much better at conceptual understanding and problem solving. Far, far better than demonstrate and practice. Um, but let me now return to the first question. What counts? What are the big ideas that characterize that kind of classroom? And I'm gonna claim, and again, there's, loads of stuff you can read that five dimensions of classroom activity are what count. Here goes. 
first is the discipline, uh, the content. If the students are not engaging with rich content, you simply can't expect them to learn very much. So necessary condition, it's pretty obvious you need good stuff for the students to be engaging with. In this particular case, um, you know, there's real substance in terms of the different representations of numbers, connections between them, ordering size, all the things you'd expect. Okay, so the content is rich. And actually, it should say, and newer versions will, content and practices, because a fundamental part of mathematics learning is the practice of explaining. And in this case, the students were doing a lot of really substantive explaining. Dimension two is cognitive demand. Um, short version of that students should be able to engage in sense making and productive struggle uh, invoke the literature we go to something like the zone of proximal development students learn best when they're stretched but stretched only a certain amount um, you could see that happening all across the tape i don't have to say much more about that the third thing, remember, we're talking about equitable classrooms. And that means um, that every student, each student, has to have the opportunities to engage with the core content, with the meaningful content. Um, you know, if you have activity groups where in literature, it would be some kids are decoding words and others are talking about plot and motivation. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. It's not a robust classroom unless every single student is engaged with the key ideas in meaningful ways. And to the degree that you could see the hub of that hubs of activity in the classroom. It was happening across the boards. Um, but access is only the first part of equity. Um, it's not just do you get to engage, it's how do you get to engage and what does that mean about the disciplinary sense of yourself that you build? Um, we were talking in our conversations earlier about the kind of people who are perfectly comfortable saying you meet them at a party and uh, they find out you're a math teacher and they say, ah, I gave up on math in fourth grade when they told me to turn the fractions upside down or in sixth grade when they said a minus times a minus is a plus. I'm just not a math person. And you know they wouldn't say the same thing about Oh, I stopped reading years ago. I'm illiterate. There's something about math and the way we present it that allows people almost to be proud of their lack of mathematical literacy. And when we ask about where it comes from, that's the societal thing. But in class, it comes from their not having had the opportunities to build a sense of themselves as someone who is a mathematical sense maker who can do mathematical thinking. So it's not just dimension three equitable access. It's do I have the experiences in the classroom that position me such that I can get ideas on the table, that I can contribute to mathematical conversations, that I can build on others' conversations so that I come to see myself as a mathematical sense maker? Do I develop the sense of agency that says I'm willing to pitch in? Do I develop the sense of ownership that says, hey, I made sense of this, this is mine, it's not just what they told me? And do I develop a sense of 
myself as a doer of mathematics, a productive, positive mathematical identity. The identities that people develop as a result of their classroom experience are fundamentally important. That's four out of five. The fifth dimension is formative assessment. Um, and that is the degree to which student thinking is made public and the environment responds in ways that are productive for the students. And I want to say a little bit more about that. Um, because of the way you saw it play out in this video, many people think formative assessment means hearing student thinking, and then the go teacher goes and fixes it. And as a matter of fact, we had a national board certified teacher working with us when we were building the formative assessment lessons. And she said to the chief lesson designer, you've made my life absolutely horrible because now I know about all these mistakes my students make and I have to go around fixing them. Student displays a misconception, I run over, I have to fix it. No sooner have I fixed that than another student does and I run over and fix that. It's like playing whack-a-mole. I keep whacking misconceptions. And Malcolm said, no, give it time. You're not the only one who's the sense maker here. And in that video, what you saw so powerfully is that when the students are part of a sense making community, a large degree of the, in, the meaningful instruction, meeting the other students where they are, setting the right level of cognitive demand, the right level of working within the ZPD comes from the students and not the teachers. So it's a matter of orchestrating a powerful environment. Before I go on, since five is still a lot, although when I've done a two hour workshop, People, if I had an exit ticket that said, name the five dimensions, people could chant them. You get used to doing it pretty fast. I wanna point out that they cluster in natural ways. And this is the way I really think about it. The content is utterly essential. Things will never be richer than the content that students engage with. Second, it's got to be equitable, but equitable means more than access. It means every student gets to engage in ways that build a sense of agency, ownership, and identity. So content and equity related access and identity. And then how do you make sure it happens through formative assessment which sets the right level of cognitive demand. So the big picture is you need rich content, mechanisms for guaranteeing that every student engages equitably in ways that support agency and identity. And those mechanisms are supported by formative assessment, which helps make sure students are engaged in productive struggle. That's the way I think about it. That's the way I talk about it. Key point, what matters here is the student's experience. Four of the five dimensions talk about the way the students experience the content, cognitive demand, equitable access, agency, formative assessment. That's essential. The teacher is the one who crafts the environment, but the real question is how does the student experience it? Okay. So if I were to wrap up about question one, some key points about what's central and to carry away about true. The first I hinted at, the true dimensions are necessary and sufficient. That is, if things go well along all five dimensions, the kids will emerge as powerful thinkers. 
to the degree that they don't, the students won't. And that's important because that says you've got five or maybe if you cluster them the way I just did, three things to keep in mind as you plan, as you engage in professional development, as you reflect on what you're doing, okay? Second, what I noted before, four of the five dimensions are about the student experience. And that's critically important. The, the question you wanna ask when a teacher, when a principal or someone usually goes in to do an evaluation, the gut reaction is I like or I don't like what the teacher is doing. That's the wrong focus. The focus should be imagine myself as a student in this class how does it feel? What am I getting to do? What am I learning? Okay. Of the entire true corpus, the one thing that I consider to be the most essential slide and my favorite slide is the one that says, imagine yourself a student, observe the lesson through the student's eyes. Okay. When I think about the content, what's the big idea? How does it connect to what I know? When I think about me sitting there in class trying to engage, how long am I given to think? Do I get to do sense making? What happens when I get stuck? In what ways am I engaged? Do I explain or is it spitting back memorized answers? Am I a central math participant? Do my ideas count? Or are they on the table? Or can I successfully duck under the table? and have the class go on without me, whoops. Um, what ideas are there for me personally to get into the conversation, feel that I'm a sense maker, be recognized as a sense maker, be part of the collective construction of mathematical understanding. If these go well for a student, if the answers are positive, then you're gonna see that student emerging, powerful and empowered, okay? Third thing, really important. Most professional development frameworks are fascist and disrespectful of teachers. They say, this is what you should do in order to teach effectively. And I think that's deeply problematic. Um, think of the best teachers you've had. They were not clones of each other. I'm willing to bet if you could study what they did, they all did very well on the dimensions of true, but they did it in their own terms and the ways they could connect with their students. And the key idea behind true is that it develops principles of powerful instruction that problematize instruction. I'll get to problematizing in a minute, but the idea is there are five dimensions. The first, this is how you get to chant them on the way out, is the content. Can I make it richer? The second is cognitive demand. How do I know that my kids are engaged in productive struggle? How can I arrange that? And so on. And the idea behind true is that if you keep those five principles in mind and constantly ask yourself, how can I get better? That's what allows teachers to improve, preferably as part of a professional learning community in their own ways and consistent with their own styles without having someone tell them, thou shalt do it my way, okay? That's why it's so critical. And I can tell you that in Chicago, New York, there are aspects in Los Angeles as well um, that are uh, Teach for America is working in Los Angeles in a variety of places. Each of them have developed their own PD consistent with, motivated by in some ways true, you can use true as a completeness check, but consistent with what they're doing, okay? Number four, a lot of places say, 
do this, use these tools. We have some tools, but the most important thing is that true is a way of thinking about what ought to happen and reflecting on what goes on. The reason I have true provides a language highlighted is that Chicago redid all of its instru math instruction and now it's doing STEM instruction using true. And the head of Chicago mathematics said that a principal told her for the first time I can talk to my kindergarten teachers, I can talk to my eighth grade teachers, they can talk to each other, and they're all using the same language about their students learning, and they're talking about improving in the same ways. That's what counts. We'll get to the tools very briefly next. And the fifth thing, this is an administrative thing. Um, we work with Oakland Unified School District and the department chair said, uh, look, I've got 11 initiatives right now. I don't need a 12th. And she was absolutely right. Those initiatives drive you crazy. I just listed a few here that they have to do. If you think of each of them as a set of things you have to do, you're in deep trouble. But take any one of these. I don't care whether it's a history framework, next generation science standards, writers, reader writers workshops, and ask these questions. How can I make the content deeper? How can I make sure my kids are engaged in productive struggle? How can I make sure that every student is involved with core activities in ways that support agency productive identities? How can I be sure I know where they're thinking and adjust accordingly? True serves as a way of unifying the disparate things teachers work on and departments and schools work on. Okay, if you believe it, Then the question is, what can you do to support teachers? And I did say I wanted to give time for Q&A. So um, I'm gonna zip through this and point to uh, places on our website um, that have these two tools and wall, more. We've been developing a substantial set of tools that get used in have gotten used across the country in all the districts that I mentioned before. The first um, is the formative assessment lessons. You saw one of them in practice. Um, there are a hundred of them. They're available for free on the Math Assessment Project website. They're linked on the True website. Um, I'll just tell you about one finding briefly. They were developed with funding from the Gates Foundation. The Gates Foundation trusts nobody. So they sent Crest and Research for Action into Kentucky to look at what happened when people used the formative assessment lessons. And they were in schools where teachers taught an average of eight to 12 days of the fouls. And what they demonstrated on a test of mathematical understanding, like a test of um, reading level, you know, when they test you and you're reading at grade level 7.2, and after a year you're reading at grade level 8.9, they go, wow, you gained 1.7 years. Okay. The researchers discovered that after 10, 8 to 12 days of instruction with the fouls, students had learned an extra 4.6 months worth of content. Now, my first reaction was, bull can't be. My second reaction was, I know exactly why. And that was the formative assessment lessons scaffold a change in pedagogy from demonstrate and practice to you engage with the material with significant support from me. And we did studies 
in teachers' classrooms watching the evolution of their style over the year as they went from mostly showing to little bit of showing after learning something from the pedagogy of a foul to by the end of the year, half as much telling, twice as much asking and supporting. That's what made for the learning differences. We also have a couple of tools, I'll just mention two. Conversation guide, basically remember I said, let's problematize. So for each um, dimension, ask a key question for agency ownership and identity. What opportunities do students have to build those? How do they explain their own and respond to each other's ideas? Take each of those questions and build it out into a set of questions that a teacher can, a teacher or better professional learning community can use for planning and then use for reflection. If you're doing lesson study, these are great for debriefing and so on. So that you can think about, I've got a lesson plan or I'm building one. Before the lesson, let me think about how to use each of these things and problematize each dimension. Afterward, let me reflect. So to give you just one example for agency ownership identity, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can ask these questions. Who generates the ideas that get discussed? What kinds of things do students get to generate and share? Are they strategies? Are they connections? Are they partial understandings, et cetera? Who evaluates and responds to each other's ideas? Think about that video we watched. How deeply do students get to explain their ideas? Think about that video we watched. What are the classroom norms, et cetera, okay? And we have those for each dimension. Similarly, if you're going in to observe a classroom, if you're an administrator or you're going in for a peer observation, you can ask yourself, left-hand side of these sheets, what would we like students to be able to be doing? Right-hand side, what can teachers be doing to support them? So this is uh, the agency ownership identity sheet we have. And on the left-hand side, preferably you discuss this before you go into a classroom with a teacher. Uh, and you say, what would you like me to focus on? Let's talk about the things I'll take notes on, et cetera. And then what you'd like for AOI is you wanna see the students take ownership of the learning process. You want them to be asking questions, building on each other, et cetera. And then you can ask, what are the supportive conditions and what the teacher might do? That's the right-hand side. Take notes and discuss them in debrief. Um, the nice thing about the observation guide we were developing true and working with San Francisco and they said, we can't wait for you to build us some tools. So they built the first version of the observation guide and they've been using it now for a number of years in their observations from by uh, principals and other personnel. Um, bottom line, this stuff works. We have a ton of evidence that it works at this point. Um, my goal is to support people in doing this. So these tools are available for free. If you go to the True Framework website, there are a bunch of research papers. There are the tools I've mentioned and more. If you go to the Math Assessment Framework, map, you'll get the formative assessment lessons and others. And um, I hope they work for you. Uh, I'm really trying to be a good boy and uh, end with enough time for Q&A. So I'm going to stop here and stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to Shira. Hey, thank you so much for that talk, Dr. Strawfield. Um, so if you guys want to put your questions in the chat, um, either I or uh, I can read them out or you can read them out and um, 
we'll just engage in a conversation. Okay, one thing I can see is Sarah asked about sharing the paper and I had sent a copy to- Yes, yeah, it should be in the, um, you should be able to download it from the Zoom chat, um, but it, if not, so I think Sarah and I were able to um, deal with that privately offline. But if anyone else has a problem, just let me know too. Could you please put the links in the chat? Is that the links from the presentation for the true framework? For the paper, I think. For the for paper. Why, why are teaching and learning mathematics so Sure, hard. I can attach it again. Right. <clears throat> Oh, the tools. Um, let me make sure I get the link right for True Framework. So I'm going to go to it, copy it, and then paste it in the link. So we also have a question. Has this framework been studied with pre-service teachers? Yeah. Um, some 20, now it's almost 25 years ago we started rebuilding our teacher preparation programs at berkeley and we had one called maxme which was a master's and credential in math and science education um barbara white was in charge of the science part i was in charge of the math part and we did that for many years and it was a funny thing because um, mathematicians talk about problem solving, scientists talk about inquiry, and never the twain shall meet. And we always talked about the fact that we should be doing the same thing, but never could. And after I developed True, I talked to Barbara and I said, you know, I think I have something that applies to science. And she said, yeah, right. And we talked about it and um she said i think it's worth giving a shot and about must have been eight years ago uh i'm hoping someone will get that soon about eight years ago what we did was we changed the foundations of maxme to be true based um and we started with having our student teachers learn about true we did a couple of workshops then go into classrooms to do observations and uh, their observation sheet was grounded in the true framework where uh, they took notes based on what the opportunities they saw, saw students having. Then when they built their lesson plans, uh, they built them by planning, using true as a mechanism in the way that I described, how am I paying attention to each of the five dimensions? And then um, the debriefs that they did when they brought the videos of their student teaching back were grounded in true. Uh, we don't have a great deal of data on how it worked, but what we do have is um, a substantial amount of testimonial for what that's worth. Um, so let me, as long as I'm looking at the chat, address the second one because it makes an interesting point as well, which is has the framework been studied with special education teachers? Um, two comments about that. The leading comment, you'll notice the slide that I put up um, said the content. There is a mathematics specific version for dimension one that says the mathematics, but the content is that way, because if you swap out mathematics and put in English language arts or swap out mathematics and put in um, science or social studies, 
everything else, the other four dimensions still apply. True is about powerful learning environments. And it's actually true about schools as powerful learning environments for teachers, about universities as powerful learning environments for students and teachers, and so on. Um, so true applies across the boards for whatever group of people, whatever learning environment you've tried to create. The two groups of people who took most naturally to it and fastest were elementary school teachers and special ed teachers. The elementary school teachers said, you know, math teachers, secondary math teachers have said at times, hey, you know, math is the center, where is it? And I've had to do a little bit of work. Elementary school teachers go, hey, this is about whole child with a meaningful way of doing math and the other things. Special ed teachers have said something very similar in that when you talk about formative assessment and cognitive demand, you're really talking about paying attention to each and every student and the strengths they build and the ways you want to build on them. That is core to the ways we think about teaching. Uh, so philosophically, it's a very comfortable umbrella. In terms of substance I can offer you, if you think about true as a philosophy, it rings true. If you think about true as a set of tools, I'm just a single math guy who's only been doing this for so many years. Uh, I'm not qualified to do it in special ed. I'm not qualified to do it in ELA. And my passionate hope is that people will band together and build tools and share knowledge so that we can do this as an extended learning community. To the degree that there are people doing that, um, I think it's a win. Tomorrow morning, I have a Zoom conversation with a couple of colleagues in Germany who have been studying dialogic cognition and building tools for measuring the degree to which students are actively engaged in what I would place comfortably under dimension four opportunities for agency ownership identity and dimension two cognitive demand. And they're getting nice data and they're building tools. So whether it's um, special ed, whether it's elementary ed, whether it's math, there's a lot more to be done. This is a framework, and I see this as something we can work on fleshing out collectively for many, many years to come. I think that's a that's a good note to end on as, as we come on four o'clock. Um, so first of all, thank you so much. I think everyone can join me in, in saying thank you. Um, thank you for joining us today at the, um, at the lecture. And um, we hope we have the next lecture coming up on November 5th with Dr. Mark. Marta Seville, um, so we hope that you guys can join us for that too. Thank you so much. Okay, I will send you a PowerPoint so you can share it with whoever would like it. Okay, great. Okay, take care everyone. Good being with you. Thank you.